Have you ever wanted to visualize everywhere you've traveled? Think it'd be cool to track your location in a self-hosted manner? Want to gamify your exercise by ensuring every time you go for a walk, you're actually walking in a unique location that you've never been before. If any of that sounds interesting, keep watching because today we're going to be looking at OwnTracks. OwnTracks is a free and open source tool that I stumbled across the other day that lets you track your location in, most importantly, a self-hosted manner. So none of this data is going to any sort of cloud. It just stays local on your own server and own hardware. All right, so first thing, let's just Google OwnTracks and see what shows up. So there's quite a few different results. Um, this is, I guess, their official website, but we are interested in looking at their GitHub page. So the GitHub Recorder app, this is the piece of software that needs to get installed on your server. Um, so there's a lot of documentation here and, and how it works. Um, so there are two different ways that the app sends messages to the server. There's MQTT or HTTP. Uh, to keep it as simple as possible, we're gonna be using HTTP today because that um, requires less setup. Um, and what we wanna do now is look for the Docker installation. So we don't wanna necessarily install this on our um, Linux machine as is, we just wanna run it in Docker. Um, so we can see here, we also have a Docker image and it's documented in the booklet. So let's just click this. And this is documented on the Docker recorder repository. So I'm looking for a Docker compose file that I can steal. Um, so here's the quick start if you just wanna run it with Docker run. I prefer using compose since that's how most of all my other services are. So I'm gonna keep looking for the Docker compose file. So here it is right here. And we need to make a Docker compose file on the server where you intend to deploy this. So for me, I've connected to a virtual machine that I have in my home lab here running on the server back there. I've connected to it in VS Code via SSH. Um, maybe you're running it on your local host and you don't need to SSH, but just connect to wherever you are deploying this. And I'm gonna create a file called OwnTracks demo. And in here, we'll make the Docker Compose file, docker compose.yaml. And let's paste the contents in here. And I'm gonna get rid of these spaces just because it bothers me that there's spaces here. And this is almost ready to go as is, but we wanna do one additional thing to disable MQTT by default and use HTTP instead, which is just simpler. So let's go back to that page where they had documentation and we need to, I'm just gonna copy all of this to get the formatting correct and paste this in and get rid of these. And the environment variable we need is OTR port. OTR port, and we need to set this equal to zero. This disables MQTT. Now it's not actually documented anywhere on this page that I could see, um, but there is a page that shows all the environment variables. I'm trying to find it. Okay, so here's the list of parameters. And I'm gonna look for OTR. OTR port. So it's not explicitly documented here. Like it doesn't say if it's zero, it means it's disabling it, but I found that through some Googling that that is how it works. Um, so you just have to trust me on that one. So now that we have that set up, let's kind of look at what this is going to do. So it's going to create a service called OT Recorder, pull this image, use these ports, create these volumes, and we've just told it to restart unless stop. And we are providing it this extra environment variable. So real simple. So now let's just CD into that own tracks demo directory. Make sure that the Docker compose file didn't disappear and just run Docker compose up. Docker compose up. You may need to run sudo with this, but let's just get this running. So as you can see now, it's pulling the image because I didn't have it locally and it's creating the service. And now you see not using MQTT disabled by port equals zero. So, okay, this is good. It looks like it might be ready to go. Um, I'm just gonna open up a new terminal and get the IP address of this VM because I don't know what it is because we're gonna have to visit the web page now. So grab this IP and we're gonna visit 
port 8083. All right, so let's go back to the browser. We'll close that for now. Close that and paste here and go 8083. Whoops. 8083. Okay, if you see this, this is a good sign. This means that the service is up and running on your server. If you ran this locally, you can use localhost instead of the IP address. Um, but the next step involves installing the software on your phone and connecting to the server. So let's take a look at how that works. All right, so I've got my phone here. We're gonna install the application. So I'm gonna to go to the app store and search for own tracks, own tracks, and download this. And let's open it up. And initially you're gonna be bombarded with a lot of messages asking for permission for various services. So just click allow and yes and continue through all of this. All right, so now we actually need to configure this to communicate with our server. So in the top left-hand corner, click on that I that you see and go to settings. And the first thing we need to do is change the mode from MQTT to HTTP, click continue. User ID, I'm gonna change that to franchise 923, but you can just change it to whatever you want. This is just a way to identify the device. And then authentication will turn off. And URL, this is gonna be our URL that we're accessing the server on. So in my case, it is 192.168.0.1. An important note, you need to add the slash pub endpoint. So this is the endpoint that the, the client device uses to publish the points to. So it won't work unless you give it slash pub. And you might think that that's all we need to do. And if you go back, you might think that it's saved, but you notice the status has this error message. And if we go into settings, what we actually need to do is we need to publish these settings. So let's take a look at the logging from this container. And when I click publish settings, we should see some, some, some logging here indicating that it's been published. So I'm gonna click publish settings and it's asking my phone if I wanna allow access to the local network. And I said yes. And you can see here, receive config dump, storing at blah, blah, blah. So that's good. That means the phone was able to talk to the server. And if we, if we refresh here, there we go, we see our devices there. So this is great, it's communicating. So next, let's actually go outside and um, check to make sure it's working. But before we do that, let's talk about how there's different modes of operation and, and how this is working for me right now. So obviously this server is on my internal network. Um, there are instructions on how you can host this publicly with a URL that you could access on the public internet. I'm not gonna do that because I don't feel it necessary. Um, so there are different options. So option one is you don't connect to it while you're outside of your house. And what's going to happen is the app is going to pull a bunch of points and it, it'll save them basically on the, on the client device. And then once it returns back to your Wi-Fi when it can access the server, it's going to dump all the points that it saved while you were out. So that's one option. Another option is using a VPN. So I have a WireGuard VPN set up. When I leave my Wi-Fi, it turns on by default, and then there's no communication issue. It's just as if I was still on my home network and it's able to publish every point when it actually happens. So there's different modes that you know could work for you depending on your situation. So I think for right now, I'll go out and disconnect Wi-Fi, turn my VPN off, and kind of demonstrate what that looks like, how it pulls the points and saves them until it gets back to Wi-Fi. So, uh, let's go test that out. All right, guys, one important thing I forgot to mention is changing between significant and move. So if you look at the map when you first open the app, at the top, you'll notice there's quiet, manual, significant, and move. So anytime you want to record your data in an accurate manner, you want to switch that to move. All right, I am back from the walk, and you see there are 200 points that were tracked. So one thing I did forget to mention, and I found this out as I was actually walking, is we needed to change the location displacement value to something smaller, because I think it was set to 500 by default. So I was noticing when I was walking, no points were showing up. 
Um, and it was because the location displacement was, I think, 500. So I would have had to move 500 meters before it tracked my location. So I changed it to five, then that got everything working. So you'll notice that these points show up as like badge icons on the app. Now I'm going to connect to Wi-Fi. Now we're officially on Wi-Fi. You see it just dropped to 203. Yeah, see all that? So it's kind of going crazy here, connecting and sending. So once this gets down to zero, we'll take a look at, at the browser and we should be able to see our points on the map. All right, getting close. Almost, all right, so now we're synced up. Let's take a look. All right, so here's our map that got created as a result of us going for a walk earlier today. Um, you'll notice in the upper left-hand corner that there are some points that are missing, and that's because the location displacement setting was set too high. Uh, I think it was 200 or 500 by default, and that's fine for if you're traveling in a car, but if you're on foot walking, uh, you're going to want location displacement to be a little bit lower. I did want to mention that there's an API endpoint that you can query, so you can query this programmatically if you wanted to get this data. Uh, say you wanted to you know, build a website that would pull this data in. Uh, there is an endpoint you can hit. So let me just demonstrate that because I think that's pretty cool. So if we go to just Google own tracks API, we should find their documentation. And right here is their API documentation. And we're interested in this locations endpoint. So I'm going to copy this request and bring it into Postman and just make, make a request to our server. So instead of this, we're going to give it our IP address. 186. And I'm going to get rid of this for now. So if we just try it like this, it's not going to work because it's saying user and device are required. So we're going to give it a user parameter of franchise923, and this will be whatever you set your user to. and device, so you can find your device on the previous page that we were just on. It was also in this request, so we can just snag this here. So let's try this, send this request. And this is awesome, this is giving us all of our data. So there's a count of 236, so 236 points uh, we have the battery percentage, the la uh, longitude, the accuracy, uh, the Wi-Fi, the latitude, altitude. So we have elevation values. Um, so I'm going to show you why that is kind of cool in a second. Uh, all kinds of cool data. And this is being returned by default in JSON. But when, when you're working with geospatial data like this, and what I mean by geospatial data is data that has a positional component or latitude, longitude component to it. Um, there's another standard that is often used called GeoJSON. It's based off of JSON, but um, this also supports returning in GeoJSON instead of JSON. So we're just going to return this in GeoJSON. And you'll notice the formatting of this changes a little bit. It still looks like JSON, but it, it's in a very structured format known as GeoJSON. Um, so there's a lot of software that can ingest GeoJSON and work with it. So as an example, I'm gonna copy this data and I'm gonna open up an application called QGIS. All right, so now we just need to make a file. Let's just put this file anywhere. It doesn't really matter. So I'm gonna make a new file. Let's just open this up with Visual Studio Code. Paste this in. And we're gonna save this as a GeoJSON instead of a text file. So let's just call it my, let's just call it own tracks dot geojson. And you see VS code picked up on it because it's a known format. And if we go now to QGIS and browse to this location, uh, we'll pull it in and we'll see what it looks like. All right, so there we go. That's what we saw in the browser. But this QGIS application is designed for working with this type of data. What I was saying, elevation would be cool to have a value. So we can symbolize this data based on different fields and altitude's a good one to symbolize this on. So if we were walking up a mountain, 
we could change the colors, the color scheme of these points based on the elevation values. So as we were going up, it would get more red and more red or um, greener and greener as you go down closer to a lower elevation or whatever color scheme you wanted to come up with. But there's a lot of cool um, stuff you can do with that. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much everything I wanted to show you guys. That's as much as I've done with it so far. I'm just going to leave this running on my home lab and collect a bunch of points. And like I said, I wanted to gamify exercising. I want to try to cover the entire map basically around where I live uh, and just, you know, try to build that map out as far as I can. It's kind of a challenge just to, to explore new areas. So, um, yeah, hopefully this video was informative or helpful or piqued your interest a little bit. Um, I enjoy making these videos. So if you enjoyed it, just give me a like or a thumbs up and uh, I'll catch you guys in the next video.